century as the eschatological anticipations got transformed into the uh, building of uh, ecclesiastical structures and institutions that uh, um, were um, um, promoting uh, the sustainable development of those states and those nations in which church was uh, um, preaching the good gospel. And the most, the brightest biblical um, quotation that somehow solved this eschatological tension between the expectations of the uh, God's kingdom and the necessity to construct a society on the principles of sustainable development, we find in the second epistle of uh, uh, Apostle Paul uh, 3.8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. In the 20th century, the connection between the um, uh, heavenly kingdom and the development of uh, human civilization is clearly and in, in a balanced way expressed in the 20 in the 39th paragraph of the constitution about uh, about church in the contemporary world Gaudium et spes. Therefore, while we are warned that it profits a man nothing if he gain the whole world and lose himself, the expectation of the new earth must not weaken but rather stimulate our concern for cultivating this one. For here grows the body of the new human family, a body which even now is able to give some kind of foreshadowing of the new age. Hence, while every progress must be carefully distinguished from the growth of Christ's kingdom to the extent that the former can contribute to the better ordering of human society, it is of vital concern to the kingdom of God. Such a positive formulation of uh, interconnection between the, king, the um, uh, heavenly kingdom God's kingdom and sustainable development of society represents um, the great trust uh, on behalf of the church towards the social institutions and the sustainable development of a human global family. Today, Helen um, introduced this interconnection very nicely. The social teaching of Catholic Church, according to Thomas Masaya, has a huge transformational power that in the 20th and 21st centuries remains um, the a significant uh, prophetic voice uh, that is guarding the preservation of human life. For the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, this social teaching is not something new. The leaders of the church are very profoundly using uh, these, uh, um, according to Christina Polatko, who is my colleague, uh, who um, used to teach the social teaching of the Christian church here at Ukur, and also conducted uh, certificate programs uh, about social teaching of the Catholic Church, said, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, although belongs to the Ecumenical Catholic Church, it has its specific uh, in ritualty and theology and uh, takes a lot from the Eastern churches of Christianity, uh, Christianity. Although this church borrows a lot from the Roman Catholic Church, perhaps sometimes even more than it would be necessary, and he, this is where I agree with Christina, it still introduces its own accents, underlinings and formulations, end of quote. A great um, uh, treasure for our church is theological and socially oriented heritage of the Metropolitan Andrei Shepitsky. Yesterday's uh, morning session of our Ecumenic Social uh, Week uh, also um, uh, testifies of this. Uh, during this session, uh, Reverend Rostislav Pindu, Roxelana Vernovska, Natalia Smutok, and Irina Pishuk were discussing about Andrei Shepitsky as a promoter of sustainable development. A recent example in our Ukrainian context was um, the sermon, the preaching, and the uh, personal authority of Vladimir Huza, um, who, and together with his uh, uh, follower um, Svetoslav, were using all possible occasions in order to um, uh, speak against corruption in the Ukrainian society, to increase the level of trust among people, and to form love for God and uh, motherland. Um, by his blessing and by his promotion, we had um, a compendium of social teaching of the Catholic Church published in Ukrainian, as well as other social projects such as Caritas, where um, also, we are also owing to him. Um, in the uh, crucial days and months of the revolution of dignity in 2012 and 23, uh, all the faithful uh, parishes and the priests of the Ukrainian Catholic Church by their solidarity and their support, and also by their uh, prayer and their sermon, um, were, were standing um, hand in hand with the other um, people who were fighting 
for the rights on dignity, uh, who were fighting for the rights, um, human rights. And uh, we heard um, some revelations about this from our uh, professor of the Ukrainian Catholic Univers University, um, uh, um, Mikhailo Dinit, a bright and authoritative communicator of these ideas is also Miroslav Marinovich, who without any exaggeration can be um, cause can be called a person who dedicated all his life uh, to the uh, deal of uh, um, um, of consolidating uh, the harmonious relations between church and the state and also fostering European and Christian values in the Ukrainian society. He is the author and editor of numerous works dedicated to this topic. In the contemporary context, uh, uh, the uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church produced a lot of uh, digni um, a lot of uh, uh, worthy documents that inform and uh, form um, a social teaching of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Um, socially oriented uh, works have been uh, published. Uh, in uh, 2020, uh, we public, uh, uh, there was published a post-synodal message. Um, only one thing will remain, what you have given to, um, to the uh, poor. Um, it's a message from the bishops of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic churches dedicated to the problem of poverty. Uh, a couple of months ago, literally, uh, exactly on the 15th of uh, November uh, 2021, um, the, min the Ministry of Environment and the Ukrainian um, Council of Churches and Religious Organizations united their efforts for the development of uh, state confession um, relations in the sphere of uh, environmental protection. Um, the Minister of uh, Environment and Natural Resources of Ukraine, Roman Abramovsky, and um, uh, the head of the um, All Ukrainian National Council of Churches and Religious Organizations, and the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Svetoslav, um, signed a memorandum about cooperation uh, that envisages the development of ecological education and fostering um, and uh, aware, fostering awareness among the citizens, a careful and uh, loving attitude to nature. Um, uh, to, uh, also, it fosters introduction of spiritual and moral uh, basics in forming and realization of ecological policy. Um, and one of its aims is to create uh, a council uh, on the issues of cooperation between the Ukrainian um, Council of Churches and religious organizations. In practice, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church um, is aware of the significance that the social uh, teaching uh, would be organizational, systematic, and professional that would be directed to everyone, um, regardless of their ethnic, religious uh, identity, and would not be a way of proselytism, but about, uh, but about uh, uh, rather a martyr, a martyr, martyrdom that was um, discussed during our first session of the Ukrainian Christian Academic Society after um, uh, uh, entitled Ecumenism of Martyrs. Um, uh, Didier Rans, Germano Marani, Antoine Arzakovsky, and Bishop uh, Job Getcha, together with Pavlos Mitsnyuk, were very deeply um, discussing this aspect of the uh, church of the ecclesiastical nature. The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church is uh, carrying out its social service in the following uh, in the following uh, directions: uh, working with children and youth in the sphere of uh, healthcare and um, healthy way of life. Uh, to get, uh, it's working in the community together with migrants, um, supporting families, uh, supporting people with functional uh, problems and uh, uh, shortnesses. Another um, attempt, uh, one, one more fact should be mentioned um, is uh, uh, that uh, the, 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 chief, the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church uh, agreed to, to uh, cooperate with the center of um, the civil, um, uh, uh, civil center at the Ministry of Health. Uh, that within the framework of um, cooperation with the government of the United States are now realizing a project of international technical support uh, for improving monitoring, epidemiological um, uh, support, and reacting to, the, to any um, flashes of diseases and also their prevention. The church is um, 
realizing its social programs through uh, local villages, communities, and church lay movements um, that are acting in uh, on the level of parishes through the uh, Caritas Ukraine, that is uh, um, official uh, charity organization of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, uh, through the um, monasteries and uh, uh, friars, uh, through the cooperation with the civil um, charity funds. Um, I am talking about all this in the context um, that uh, Ukraine, uh, through the 50 years in the 20th century, used to be a socialist republic. So social protection and care was uh, a kind of uh, coming, um, stepping stone. Was a kind of stepping stone. We know that uh, social protection was there around in the second half of the 20th century in the Soviet Union, but it was deeply biased, uh, a sort of mm, aimed at the at the protection of and uh, defense of human being, but in fact it was not working, it failed. And when Ukraine um, um, went out of the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, we could face a huge social failure. Um, it was the church that took um, its responsibility um, on this, uh, on the lack of, of responsibility for the lack of uh, social care, and it took on itself all the functions that the state was supposed to uh, to take. Ukraine is still one of the poorest countries in Europe. It is only associative member of the European Union, and despite the fact that we are an associative member. Uh, we still witness a very slow implementation, uh, both on the state level and the local level, those uh, implementation of those social level, social principles that I've been talking about. And religious organizations play this compensatory role. And finally, I would like to share the experience of our university. The Ukrainian Catholic University was the first one in Ukraine to introduce the so-called service learning approach socially oriented teaching and within this uh, service learning project our students are, um, are solving real uh, issues in their uh, in their communities while they are studying this uh, kind of attitude motivates students um, to make their studying more meaningful um, maybe in and other, under other circumstances the realization of such projects would be rather costly it's significant to understand that this is not about volunteering. Um, it's uh, it's about social change. So this SL social um, service learning is a vertical where uh, upstairs you have those who are helping, and downstairs are those that are receiving this uh, uh, help. No, this is a wrong understanding. SL is a horizontal line, and it is significant to understand that this is not something that we're doing for the community. This is something that we do with the community. The idea of social-oriented learning uh, calls back to the thought of Metropolitan Andrei Shepitsky in the sense that it's not worth every time to provide uh, a human being with a, uh, with a glass of water or a um, slice of bread. We need to show human, um, uh, a man a way to the lake or uh, to provide him with the skills how to make, to bake his own bread. So um, the same is true for the community. If you don't provide people with uh, the, the uh, plenipotentiaries to, in, to create initiatives, uh, people will be passively waiting for the glasses of water and for bread. Um, I teach at the university um, uh, ecotheology. I have two courses. And uh, we asked our students uh, to plan um, so I, together with the colleagues in the Center of Ecotheology and Sustainable Development, offered students uh, at Ukrainian Catholic University a course of so-called uh, core course. Um, um, it's a selective discipline that is called Human Being, Nature, God, Introduction to Ecotheology. Apart from the worldview topics that we uh, discuss, we also implement the project of campaign. Um, the main of this project is uh, to reduce at least by 25% by the amount of uh, solid waste 
that is being buried, uh, that is being burned, and that um, uh, contaminates the uh, environment. And so, I would like to, I would like to finish my uh, work with the following words: Everything that you have done for my, um, um, my minor brothers, you have done for me. Matthew twenty five. And this is great, and also good supplement to previous previous uh, uh, speakers uh, because uh, the first one mentioned that uh, development should be contextual, and here we have contextualization of development uh, efforts in Ukraine, and also uh, the, the second speaker uh, was speaking more on ecological uh, side of sustainable development, and you broadened this discussion uh, by mentioning corruption, transparency, trans uh, tra uh, trust in society, so this is a good supplement. Uh, thanks for this. And we move to our next speaker, speaker before the break. So the Q&A session will be moved uh, toward the end of uh, the seminar. And uh, let me introduce uh, to you uh, Ivan Krunak. Ivan is uh, an UKU graduate of uh, 2019. His master thesis wa was on the critique of contemporary theories of uh, justice from the Catholic point of view. His research interests primarily focus on wealth distribution. And something tells me that his participation in the exchange program at Kyle Leuven during his early years of studies played not the least role in his choice of this academic trajectory. Ivan is one of uh, very few Ukrainians who study the academic field of Catholic social thought in depth, really in depth. Currently, he pursues the Advanced Research Master degree at the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies of Kyle Leuven. So, so perfectly fitting into today's conversation, Ivan Prunak's uh, research is about financial markets and their impact on integral human development. Ivan, we are looking forward to hearing more on this matter now. So, please. Thank you, Hester, for this kind introduction. Good morning, dear professors from Leuven, dear professors of UKU, and dear listeners. How can the financial markets influence the process of integral human development negatively? This is a challenging question I tackle in the first chapter of my master thesis research at KA Leuven and titled Finance through the Prism of Catholic Social Teaching, an option for ethical investing, which I aim to present here. And additionally, I would like to present some insights that I would like to integrate into the second part of my research. Within the context of this ecumenical conference, I thought it might be interesting to dedicate my attention to the document on finance, economic et pecuniary questiones. And hereafter, I refer to the document as OPQ. The document promulgated in 2018 by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and the Custody for Promoting Integral Human Development of the, Ram of the Roman Catholic Church. For the document analyzes the current situation in the financial sector through the prism of the social teaching of the Catholic Church. But let me start our discussion with a clarification of the nature of the financial markets and why they are different from the market for apples, as political philosopher Lisa Herzog would put it. In her chapter, Just Financial Markets, Finance in a Just Society, Herzog points out that the financial markets are distinct from the other markets in at least three aspects concerning nature of products, participants, and the lack of equilibrium. Firstly, unlike in the markets where physical products are traded, financial markets trade products of highly artificial legal constructs. Herzog states, financial markets are highly abstract entities and therefore they are difficult to grasp. All we see are charts on computer screens in green or red and maybe some pictures of nervous people in suits shouting orders at each other from their trading desk. Secondly, Herzog explains that in the financial markets, corporations are mostly the main participants. Hence, the shareholders of corporations enjoy limited liability by definition because they are only liable with the capital they have invested, not with their private capital. Finally, before 2008, Many were wrongfully persuaded that the financial markets operated in accordance with the so-called efficient market hypothesis. 
Herzog claims, financial markets were seen as similar to other markets in this respect. The possibility that financial markets might create instability from within was not simply on the radar. However, the great financial crisis of 2008 showed that the financial markets failed to reach market equilibrium. Therefore, the stabilization in the financial system could occur, which lead to financial crisis. With these three particular characteristics of the financial markets in mind, I would like to return to the church document on finance OPQ. What does the aforementioned document state on the current situation in the financial sector? The document confirms that the harm caused by the crisis of 2008 indicated that there was an urgent need for a change. The document on finance acknowledges that the positive changes have been made since the crisis, but at the same time, the financial sector continues to make a negative impact as well. Although there have been many positive efforts at various levels, which should be recognized and appreciated, there does not seem to be any inclination to rethink the obsolete criteria that continue to govern the world. Uh, the document warns us that inequalities proliferate between various countries and within them. Moreover, the number of people who live in the conditions of extreme poverty continue to be enormous. This is an indication that some current developments in the world of finance are in opposition to the sustainable development goals, particularly against SDGs 1 and 10, which indicate on the importance of the elimination of poverty and inequality. Therefore, OPQ warns that at stake is the authentic well-being of a majority of the people of our planet. In other words, uh, integral human development is at stake. The document on finance emphasizes on several actions of misconduct in the financial markets that happen due to the lack of ethics and morality. Those actions consequently increase inequality and poverty and as follows, threaten the process of the authentic integral human development. Unfortunately, due to the limited time, I am uh, unable to analyze in detail all the problems uh, in the financial markets that I indicated in the document, but I would like to provide you at least some general examples from OPQ. Overall, the document condemns any dishonest speculations and manipulations in the financial markets. The document expresses the concern when more powerful market agents exploit the vulnerabilities of less powerful agents. Paragraph 17 states, what is morally unacceptable is not simply to profit, but rather to avail oneself of an inequality for one's own advantage. In order to create enormous profits that are damaging to others or to exploit one's dominant position in order to profit by unjustly disadvantaging others or to make oneself rich through harming and disrupting the collective common good. In regard to the usury and high interest rates, OPQ is in total condemnation of excessively high interest rates and of all types of usury. It is clear that applying excessively high interest rates really beyond the range of the borrowers of funds represents a transaction not only ethically illegitimate, but also harmful to the health of the economic system. As always, such practices, along with usual activities, have been recognized by human conscience as iniquitous and by the economic system as contrary to its good functioning. Therefore, the church is not in the opposition to changing interest rates, but any usual activities that demand excessively high interest rates are considered ethically and morally inappropriate from the standpoint of the Catholic Church. Such scholars as Clark Zalewski uh, and, uh, indicate that the Catholic Church always puts the poor ones as their priority, and support of the vulnerable ones is crucial for Christians or any other people of goodwill, whether it is in the form of charity or lending, but with an adequate interest rate. However, when uh, the excessive interest rates are applied, then it often results in rich simply profiting, profiting from the misfortune of the poor. The document also dedicates much attention to the problems of the offshore banking. 
Mostly, the offshore banking practices are essential tools to disguise ownership and movement of criminal funds derived from narcotics trafficking, terrorism, arms smuggling, uh, and trafficking in human beings. But also, uh, they hide financial frauds, like, for example, tax avoiding, avoidance or money laundering. Therefore, not surprisingly, the document uh, pays much attention to such speculative practice from paragraph 29 to paragraph 32. OPQ states in paragraph 30, the world of offshore finance thrives, imposing dangers to the realization of the common good. Through the offshore channels, the well-being of societies is put at stake as such speculation, like already mentioned, like tax avoidance and money laundering, affect the adequate distribution of goods and services in the society, thus making people especially the least favorite ones, more poor. The provided examples of some problems in the financial markets indicate that there is indeed a threat to integral human development. As a response to change the financial markets in order to support rather than to hinder integral human development, a more fundamental change is needed. According to the document, the change of trajectory in the way of how humans see each other is very important. It is crucial to realize that people are not competitors, but allies. We are all interdependent, regardless of social status, sex, race, wealth, religion, or cultural background. What we need is a relational anthropology. And such relational anthropology helps the human person to recognize the validity of economic strategies, says the document, that aim above all to promote the global quality of life that leads the way towards the integral well-being of the entire person and every person. Profit should never be prioritized over the well-being of any person, but profit should work for the benefit not of powerful minority, but for everyone. The document states, profit and solidarity are no longer antagonists. Therefore, the question is, how can the financial markets not threaten, but continue, but continue to contribute to the integral human development? And for that, we need to integrate more profoundly the ethical discernment of all market agents. In order to achieve that, we need, on the one hand, external motivation, which is adequate regulatory system, and on the other hand, internal motivation, the practice of virtue. While the document on finance stresses many times on the importance of the regulation, such academics as Philip Booth criticizes the document for its overemphasis on state regulation and lack of attention to the virtue ethics. Booth claims that the treatment of virtue ethics in OFPQ is limited. He argues, it may be the case that prudent consideration leads us to believe that government regulation can help promote the common good. However, to assume so automatically would appear to presuppose a degree of perfection among those making decisions related to regulation that cannot be found among market participants. As a result of human imperfection, in other words, in the result of the sin, regulation can be shaped, can be shaped by private interests rather than developed for the general public interest. Uh, that is not to say that Philip Booth is against regulation com completely, but he believes that state regulation has its limits. Regulation alone, without virtuous agents, professionals, clients, and also regulators, cannot resolve harms caused by some procedures in the financial markets. Booth stresses that regulators, regulators as well share, share our human imperfection. As follows, Virtues are needed in the area of regulation too. Virtue ethics are essential for the adequate regulatory system, as well as for the decent behavior and ethical discernment of the financial market agents. To conclude, I would like to stress that the education of virtues and the cultural setting where those virtues are nurtured is of paramount importance. For example, the cardinal, cardinal virtues can guide our decisions of how we manage finances. Booth states, virtues such as courage, prudence, justice, and temperance 
need to be practiced if financial markets are to say to serve society effectively. For our Ukrainian context, this means that education inspired by virtue ethics towards responsibility for the common good and sustainable development should be accomplished at different levels in families, in the academic milieu, and in the ecclesial milieu as well. All Christian churches should cooperate and be involved in adequate education, since it is the key for the cultural change where respect for each other and care for the environment are in the highest priority. I would like to finish with the words of Pope Francis, Patriarch Bartholomew and Archbishop of Canterbury Justin. Now, in this moment, we have an opportunity to repent, to turn around in result, to head in the opposite direction. We must pursue generosity and fairness in the way that we live, work, use money instead of selfish gain. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan. Uh, and uh, you, it was very courageous on your side to touch upon this difficult dilemma uh, about uh, what should be left to market self-regulation, uh, what should be left to state regulation, and what is the uh, responsibility of uh, participants, what, is, uh, what should be left to ethical, ethical codes of uh, of participants of market economy, so this virtue ethics approach is very much needed. And uh, you also probably surprised many of us by mentioning in the uh, beginning that the congregation of the doctrine of faith has had something to do to this document about finances. Uh, great, and uh, so let's uh, let's move on uh, to our like break between two sessions. Let's uh, move the uh, Q and A session to, toward the end. So if you if you in the audience among the our listeners have some pressing questions, just write them down, not to forget, and uh, let's grab some tea or coffee to recharge a bit, and uh, uh, we'll be back. At uh, 10 to 10 to in 10 minutes in in 10 minutes more or less yes 11 uh, if you have our program uh, and it's uh, 11 50 ukrainian time that we should uh, continue with the second session thank you Інститут економічних студій Українського католицького університету у співпраці з фондом Конрада Аденауера за підтримки Львівської міської ради запрошують до участі у міжнародному суспільному форумі. З 5 по 9 жовтня, 14-й екумінічний соціальний тиждень, плекаючи спільне благо разом до сталого розвитку суспільства. Як спільними зусиллями досягати цілей сталого розвитку та будувати справедливий світ? Як зберегти довкілля, біорізноманіття, екосистеми суші та води? Як адаптувати міста до змін клімату? Які перспективи європейський зелений курс відкриває Україні? Яка роль бізнесу у розвитку суспільства? Як сучасна церква сприяє сталому розвитку? Крізь призму екології, економіки, інклюзії та економічного соціального вчення досліджуємо цілі сталого розвитку разом. Реєстрація та деталі на сайті isvik.org.ua. Форум відбувається онлайн.
Інститут економічних студій Українського католицького університету у співпраці з фондом Конрада Аденауера за підтримки Львівської міської ради запрошують до участі у міжнародному суспільному форумі. З 5 по 9 жовтня, 14-й екумінічний соціальний тиждень, плекаючи спільне благо разом до сталого розвитку суспільства. Як спільними зусиллями досягати цілий сталого розвитку та будувати справедливий світ? Як зберегти довкілля, біорізноманіття, екосистеми суші та води? Як адаптувати міста до змін клімату? Які перспективи європейський зелений курс відкриває Україні? Яка роль бізнесу у розвитку суспільства? Як сучасна церква сприяє сталому розвитку? Крізь призму екології, економіки, інклюзії та економічного соціального вчення досліджуємо цілі сталого розвитку разом. Реєстрація та деталі на сайті isvik.org.ua. Форум відбувається онлайн. Інститут економічних студій Українського католицького університету у співпраці з фондом Конрада Аденауера за підтримки Львівської міської ради запрошують до участі у міжнародному суспільному форумі. З 5 по 9 жовтня, 14-й екумінічний соціальний тиждень, плекаючи спільне благо разом до сталого розвитку суспільства. Як спільними зусиллями досягати цілий сталого розвитку та будувати справедливий світ? Як зберегти довкілля, біорізноманіття, екосистеми суші та води? Як адаптувати міста до змін клімату? Які перспективи європейський зелений курс відкриває Україні? Яка роль бізнесу у розвитку суспільства? Як сучасна церква сприяє сталому розвитку? Крізь призму екології, економіки, інклюзії та економічного соціального вчення досліджуємо цілі сталого розвитку разом. Реєстрація та деталі на сайті isvik.org.ua. Форум відбувається онлайн. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the second session of our international seminar on the sustainable development in ecumenical perspective. Uh, I'm Oleg Kindi. Um, I had a pleasure of speaking in the first half of the session, and in the second, I will be moderating this seminar. Um, just a quick reminder, um, there is an option for the uh, Ukrainian-speaking uh, listeners to opt um, translation. Um, All of our uh, topics today will be presented in English, and if you want to stay in, uh, in the original English, um, you can also opt that um, on your uh, Zoom screen. Um, without any further um, ado, I would like to introduce uh, our first speaking, uh, speaker in our second session. It's uh, Dr. Uh, Steven van den Herbel. Um, we mentioned that um, our panel is a cooperation of uh, Ukrainian Catholic University and Catholic University of Leuven, but uh, Professor Stephen is from the Protestant Theological uh, Faculty of the Leuven uh, University. He's also a director of, of the Institute of Leadership and Social Ethics. Um, he completed his doctoral studies um, at the Evangelical Theological Faculty of Leuven and Theologische mm -hmm. Universität Kampen. Um, he's an author of, uh, and editor and co-author of uh, uh, many um, uh, books. Uh, some of his recent um, books are on historical and multidisciplinary perspectives of hope. Um, another book um, published um, uh, in Leuven, um, Being Human in Technological Age, Rethinking Theological Anthropology. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's also a co-editor of a book um, published a year ago on uh, uh, servant leadership, social entrepreneurship, and the will to serve spiritual foundations and business applications um, from, um, and so and so forth. There are many books and articles uh, where well um, uh, established uh, thinker in this sphere, and today um, Dr. Van den Heuvel will speak on the ecological crisis and the Christian virtue of hope. Uh, Steve, Steven, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, uh, and it is my pleasure to uh, speak indeed about this very topic, the ecological crisis and the Christian virtue of hope. 
Um, it's a great opportunity for me to share a bit about my research, and it is part of a wider research effort. You already mentioned the volume Historical and Multidisciplinary Perspectives on Hope, which was indeed published last year, and it stands in the context of a wider research project that is focused on hope. Uh, we've been working on this theme since 2016, and indeed I do so within the context of the Institute of Leadership and Social Ethics here in Leuven, but in collaboration with other partners as well. Hope is, I will get to the topic of um, ecology in a moment, but first I would like to say something about the phenomenon of hope as such, introducing it a bit. And the first thing to note about hope is that it is everywhere. It is a foundational human characteristic or a fundamental human characteristic, as I mentioned here in the slides. Um, the human being has, for example, by the French uh, phenomenologist Gabriel Marcel, been typified as a homo viator, a hoping being. A few weeks ago, I had to introduce the theme of hope to entrepreneurs, and then I used a simple example of the market. Markets, vendors are there with their goods and wares because they hope to sell these. People come to buy food, but also to have a chat, be among other people, etc. So the whole setup of even a simpler thing as a, a market uh, place is in the service of hope, hope for value creation. So even within this hard-nosed world of business, uh, hope is a fundamental category, uh, as has been recognized already also by Maynard Keynes, for example, who wrote the book Animal Spirits about this. But of course, hope also plays a role in all kinds of other areas as well, uh, and also connected to other questions, such as the larger question of meaning. It is a challenge to define hope well, and all different kinds of uh, scholars do so in different ways. A psychologist defines hope differently than a sociologist, etc. The common theme, though, in all these various definitions of hope is that it has two components, uncertainty and desire. So you hope for something to happen, but you're not sure that it will happen. This is captured well in the well-known definition of hope by the um, moral psychologist Adrienne Martin. I have the quotation here on the screen. She says, to hope for an outcome is to desire. It's to assign a probability somewhere between zero and one to it. So zero is if there's just no realistic possibility, one is a certainty, and everything between that is hope. So it has to do with positive expectations of the future. Uh, a number of distinctions are important, for example, the distinction between hope and optimism. Uh, the, the difference lies in agency. An optimist will always think that things will turn out okay. He or she has a positive expectation about the future, but there is no agency involved for the person to be involved in that. He or she just hopes, for example, that the weather will be nice. Uh, that is an optimistic view. But uh, for a view to be hopeful, there needs to be a measure of agency. You as a person need to be involved in the action that has a likely effect on the hoped for outcome. So that is one distinction, uh, distinction between hope and optimism, but there's other distinctions as well, uh, such as between smaller hope and big hope, passive and active hope, etc. So this is a bit about background about the phenomenon of hope, which is deep, foundational and central to the human experience and increasingly the topic of study. Um, then to ecological ethics. Hope has to do with positive aspirations, such as the example of the marketplace shows. You go to the market with the hopeful expectation to gain some goods, etc., and then maybe some other things as well. But hope is also very much a crisis emotion in the sense that you often become aware of your hopes and dreams, etc., in the context of loss and crisis. It is when there is a war that you desperately start to hope for peace. It is when you've lost something that you hope that you will find it, etc. Uh, and this brings us to the context of the ecological crisis. Uh, that is also a 
crisis situation. There is an ecological crisis. And in that context, hope and its correlative despair, despair is also when you have expectations about the future, but they are negative plays a very foundational role. That has been the case since the very beginning of the awareness of the ecological crisis in the 1960s. Alarmism, the feeling that something is wrong and needs to happen urgently, has been an important trigger uh, for the environmental movement. This alarmism, this despair, uh, was already visible, for example, in the well-known report Limits to Growth by the Club of Rome as well as in books, for example, by the theologian John Cobb, who in the 70s wrote a book with the panicky title, Is It Too Late? Uh, there you can see this very well. Uh, this was not immediate despair. Uh, it was a crisis, but there was the hope that it could be overcome. But it was hope within the context of a crisis. Uh, along the way, it was not just about overcoming the crisis, but uh, the environmental movement also formulated a more positive, hopeful perspective on the future, especially in the deep ecology movement, in which the hope was that through this crisis, we would grow to something else more positive, namely a new ecocentric approach to human being and nature. But increasingly, and this is also partly due to the uh, expanding climate crisis, it is again despair, the negative side of hope that is becoming a predominant emotion in the ecological movement. Um, and an example, it's a very a stirring picture to show this despair, this, exic, exic, uh, um, this angry accusational tone that is embedded in it is seen, for example, in the words of uh, Greta Thunberg, well known and the climate striking uh, young woman from Sweden, uh, where she challenges global leaders with the, her well known words, how dare you, etc. There's a lot of despair in this attack, essentially, um, it, 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 because there's a little, there's, there's just. Uh, no hope, there is just a despair and, and a very great urgency connected to that. And there's been some study on this, and I would like to go into this a bit, um, because when you look at the literature and the way that this message is perceived, then actually it uh, does not accomplish its goal at all. In fact, it is very much counterproductive, this gloomy, despair-based messaging around the ecological crisis is counterproductive. And this has been noted, among others, by Andrew Fiala, for example, who wrote the article, and I have the quotation here on the screen, Nero's Fiddle on Hope, Despair, and the Ecological Crisis. And in it, he argues that it is not rational to engage in ecological stewardship if it is likely that it will not benefit you anyway. Uh, if, if there's such a, a great likelihood to everything ending in despair with the world, um, yeah, it's more rational to act like Nero, the famous Roman Empire, uh, Emperor Nero, who allegedly played on the fiddle while Rome was burning. Um, this is also connected to Hardin's well-known tragedy of the commons. And this is what people, whether they're explicit about it or not, do often in response to alarmism. And a good illustration of that is provided in the book Living in Denial, Climate Change, Emotions and Everyday Life by Kari Miri Norgaard. And in it, she describes how the people of a village in Norway who are experiencing the effects of climate change firsthand through the melting of the glaciers, nevertheless react relatively slowly to this crisis with relative ease, even in highly developed countries such as Norway, we have a great eco-centric uh, awareness. There is a discourse of relativization and even denial, uh, which emerges as a rationalization for a lack of action. And some of that is also captured in popular culture. For example, in this picture, which is a picture of uh, someone from the movement uh, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, who at some point sought to um, disturb the, uh, the communal traffic by uh, 
you know buses and uh, uh, in the London tube uh, by jumping on on top of the roof, etc. To 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 signal how bad the ecological crisis is. They wanted to make a point of that, but they were angrily pulled off the roof of these tubes by common uh, commuters who just wanted to be on their way to their work or whatever. They did not want their normal lives to be disturbed by this despair-filled message around the ecology. And this makes a lot of sense from the perspective of uh, emotive theory. And for this reason, what we need is something that is not based on despair, but something that is uh, that has this positive hope goal embedded in it. And this point has been made by quite a lot of writers, for example, by Lisa Kretz in her 2013 article, Hope in Environmental Philosophy, which really signals, in which she really signals the danger of hopelessness in environmental ethics. We need a positively formulated hope goal. And this challenge to be serious about the ecological crisis, because there is a crisis, we're not going to ignore it, but at the same time to uh, formulate a positive hope goal in relation to this crisis has been taken up, for example, by Alan Thompson in his book, Radical Hope for Living Well in a Warmer World. What he does is that he goes back to the notion of radical hope as formulated by Jonathan Lear in his famous book, Radical Hope. There are also the word radical in the title. Lear was very much concerned with a hope for revival, for coming back to life in a form that is not yet intelligible. Very important to his approach is the example of the Indian chief Plenty Ku, who was the leader of the Crow Nation and who suffered greatly, that nation suffered greatly under the settlers, the uh, European settlers that came to North America and that very much disturbed their way of life. They were killing the buffaloes on which the people of the Crow Nation depended. And he describes, you know, the, the sadness and the despair connected uh, coming together when the last buffalo died. That meant that the whole way of life of a tribe was being fundamentally disturbed. And uh, Chief Plentiku, you see him here sitting in the front of the car, driving his wife who was in the back seat. Uh, Chief Plentiku, as leader of the Crown Nation, was feeling this despair, but at the same time was feeling the responsibility to move beyond despair and to craft out, to find out a new way of life for his people. So he began experimenting with planting crops, so living in a different way, not living from the buffalo, but from the land in a new way, learning from the European settlers. So he was faced with a radical uncertainty around the future, just no words, no concepts, no cultural patterns to go back to. But he was nevertheless crafting and forging a way forward to continue living radical hope. That is what uh, Jonathan Lear talks about. And Alan Thompson harks back to this notion of radical hope to say that is what we now also need um, in our world today. Now, I'm looking at the time and I'm realizing that I need to hurry up a bit. Uh, so I will move forward and say that this is then the challenge moving forward is to formulate this positive hope goal and how to do that. And here the tradition of positive psychology can help us. They have a tradition where they um, emphasize the rational side of hope. Hope is to do with formulating goals that are realistic yet ambitious. And it has to do with uh, finding ways to realize these goals. And um, the individual, the agent, the hopeful agent is very much involved in this pro process. It has to do with taking small steps out of, out, moving out of paralyzing effects of despair, focusing on what you can do in the here and now. And this is a potent and important strategy. Uh, and I think that it is a good one, but it needs additions because this strategy is very much focused on the rational individual but hope is not just an individual emotion or construct 
but it is deeply also a social phenomenon. So we need attention to uh, the role of hope in the social imaginary of the group as well. And this is where theologians who have a very clear understanding of the deep relational interdependence of human beings among each other can play a role in emphasizing this. And this is being done by Henry Simmons and Anne Dalton, for example, in their book, Ecotheology and the Practice of Hope. Okay, I am going to draw to the close. I had another slide on, on what another contribution that theology can make. Uh, emphasizing the significance of the open future right, in the way that Jürgen Moltmann, a very well-known Protestant theologian of hope, does it. Um, but um, in the interest of time, I perhaps leave it there and perhaps in the Q&A afterwards, we can uh, return to some of these uh, notions. I am correct, right, that I need to stop now? Is that a... Please. Um, um... Um, so maybe just one more word on Jürgen Moltmann. So uh, Moltmann makes a very important distinction between apocalyptic and eschatological uh, mindsets, essentially. So when you have an apocalyptic mindset, you have a very clear frame of reference as to how the future will look like, a very you know, set of what will happen. And this is juxtaposed to him with what he understands to be the true biblical message around the future, which is eschatological, which points us to a future that is open-ended, that has possibilities, and that uh, the, the, the art is to live from the future, from this realm of possibilities. And in this way, theology can um, support, undergird, and deepen the effects to try to craft a hopeful um, uh, to, to craft the ecological virtue of hope in this era of uh, ecological devastation and despair. Thank you. Um, and thank you for, for the...
an idea which hardly seems unusual for the Christian consciousness. I bet quite every one of listeners has a friend or two who ground their monarchianist or authoritarian dreams on the belief that everyone, be it in state or in family, should know his proper place under the reign of the Almighty God. Yet, there is a recent tendency in the Trinitarian theology, especially Western one, to stress the Trinitarian nature of Christian God. Given this irrefutable uh, in Christian theology tenet, these social Trinitarianists, as they call themselves habitually, make a further step and claim that human societies should imitate the lifestyle of Trinity itself. I cannot spend much time here analyzing in details the most challenging dogmatic part, that is, the question of the inner constitution of Trinity or how the concept of the image of God is used to make the divine example normative for people, all these topics are well researched. Instead, I just mention some basic dogmatic statements and devote the major part of my lecture and to the and therefore part. I will analyze how do German Lutheran theologian Jürgen Moltmann, Croatian Free Church theologian Miroslav Wolf, and Latin American Catholic Leonardo Boff interpret, interpret the Trinity-like kingdom of God and how their visions are related to the contemporary liberal democracy. Of course, it would be an unjustified exaggeration to say that God wishes us to be Democrats. My today's thesis is a more humble one. God is transcendent, wholly different from the world, and yet he wished to be comprehensible for us to some extent. Like a craftsman, a medieval theologian would say, he left in his creation a fingerprint of himself, and therefore we, the people, inherited some of his personal characteristics. The very fact that we are anyway unable to recreate the perfect Trinitarian communion on earth, to some extent give us a free hand to be creative in our search for forms of coexistence still based on the divine example. That is why Wolf rejects the blatant statement of Russian theologian Nikolai Fyodorov that Trinity is our social program, as though Trinitarian example provided us with detailed and specific political and economical program and prefers to speak rather of vision. We can imitate Trinity in some respects, but the difference between God and the world allows us to take from Trinity only contours and ultimate normative end. The other wolf's warning is that it is our attempt to Im imitate the lifestyle of Trinity. In them, we should take into account our own historical context. We do not build the world from scratch, but rather adjust its current historical reality to the divine ideal. That is why I prefer to speak of liberal democracy, not because its principles directly follow from the analysis of the life of Trinity, but because in today's world, those values and ethical principles that can be derived from the Trinitarian example seem to me fitting into the arguably the most open, creative and freedom-oriented political and social regime namely liberal democracy. Let us move to the first feature uh, that we on earth can take after our heavenly prototype, equality. The first principle is, uh, which is to varying degrees present in the works of the adherents of social Trinitarianism is a preference for egalitarianism. Already at this stage, we face the oxymoron inherently present in the very title of my lecture, what kind of equality is possible before the face of God? Moltmann, by referring to a number of scriptural passages and to a different re religious thinkers, argues that the most undivided power of God as single subject and not Trinity, or the supremacy of Father upon the other two divine persons, is a wrong concept that links leads to a wrong social consequences, such as justification of earthly tyrannies. The image of a trinity in which all the persons are equal, as in the presence of the scripture and Christian tradition, in turn corresponds to a society without privileges and without subordination. Moltmann acknowledges that theoretically, 
the union of the highest power and the highest law in God excludes earthly tyranny, but immediately adds that in actual practice, the ruler's lack of accountability to anyone else puts him outside the law and above the constitution. The harmful consequences of such a split of religion and absolutist claims, as Moltmann claims, causes a desire to liberate society from the supervision from above, from this superego in the soul and in heaven. That rebel in turn inspired European atheism. Rethinking the doctrine of God in a Trinitarian key is vital for both the missionary movement and the liberation and democratization of society. Although Moltmann does not explicitly claim that democracy is the genuinely Christian form of the social life, he still quotes Ernst Bloch and seems to agree with him that the lack of the personal relational image of God is an obstacle to the coming of the liberty of the children of God, the mystically democratic image of the kingdom which belonged to the millenarian hope. The equality of divine persons of Trinity is an example for equality not only on the level of civic society, but also gender equality. Already in the early Moltmann's work, we can see how in his interpretation of the role of the first divine person as motherly father, the author overcomes the exclusively male imagery and language in talking about God. Combine it with general critique of the authoritarian patriarchate in families, these passages open the gate wide to the different kinds of feminist social Trinitarianism. In a similar fashion, Leonardo Boff sees the adequate doctrine of Trinity as the mean of curing the illness of what he calls machismo in the church and culture. But as another social Trinitarianist, Miroslav Wolf claims, it were 60s that were about sexual and racial equality, but 90s are rather about identity. So that now we move to the second pillar of the Trinitarianist ethic, openness and relationality. The second, perhaps most fundamental premise shared by more or less by all the social Trinitarianism, uh, Trinitarianists is the vision of a person as something essentially relational. The person, be it divine or human one, is not a self-sufficient individual separated from the rest of the world. Even in the Trinity itself, the father can remain father only as a father of the son. The same is true for all the other divine persons. Each of them exists only in the presence of the other. For us, humans, it means that we should reconsider two individualist image of the person. The doctrine of social Trinitarianism is helpful to overcome such a downside of a German idealism and bourgeois culture as opposition between the individual and the communal aspects of the human personality. But for our topic, another consequence is a more important one. The person, if he or she is willing to imitate God, should be open toward the other. The Christian community should resist the temptation of displaying a fortress mentality or a pious arrogance. A fellowship with God is possible only as a fellowship in God. In other words, there is no other way to experience God as love, but in a brotherly and sisterly fellowship through mutual acceptance and participation. So the Trinity corresponds to a community in which people are defined through their relation which, with one another and in their significance for one another, not in opposition to one another in terms of power and possession. All these ideas are characteristic to theology of both Moltmann and, Wolf, uh, and Boff. Yet, I think it is important to balance this somewhat idealist picture with the remark of Miroslav Wolf, whom personally I consider to be a sober voice in this company. He agrees that in uh, the term mm, social Trinitarianism, the very word social necessarily encapsulates the relationality. The self should give space to the other without prejudice and enmity. You call a uh, wolf calls such a disposition an indiscriminative welcome. Furthermore, he calls that virtue of sand donation the only true goal that can be looted from the reflection upon the mystery of Trinity, unlike the other walk principles of social Trinitarianism. 
Yet this openness, he warms, should not be blind. The person, even if especially relational, should have an ability to defend itself. Whereas Romanian old Orthodox social Trinitarianist Dumitrius Staniloa advocates for total self-forgetting in the uh, act of love and openness uh, towards the other. Miroslav Wolf recalls us about the importance of boundaries. Not assertiveness or the self in the presence of the assertive other puts the self in the danger of being assimilated or manipulated. That is why only self not only self-respect, but also a protective policy from a government is essential to work. But how to detect the danger and how to protect oneself? Well, here Wolf only advises to seek wisdom rather than universal rule. We should not be naive and tri triumphant. We should not neglect the evil of the world and uh, the non-readiness of some people to accept our loving embraces. But this is precisely where we can do our best to become perfect uh, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. The easy, all-embracing love between friends, lovers, and soulmates, as Wolf states, will take care of itself. But the love reflected on the cross, the one-sided love that suffers for the sake of the ungrateful beloved, in the, is precisely the way we can imitate God. Wolf provides two examples of how does divine life uh, is operative in the, life of, uh, in the lives of the people through grace and forgiveness. His point is that grace does not neglect the law, but takes it seriously, and that precisely in that way overcomes it. Similarly, forgiveness does not start from the rejection of the reality of sin, but by affirmation of its gravity, and yet the love overpowers the guilt. We should deal with evil not by closing our eyes on its existence, but by overcoming it with love. We should open our, uh, our embraces toward everyone, but be aware of the possibility to be harmed in return. Trinitarian love is not passive. Wolf quotes Paul, let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The deeds of darkness, for instance, sleeping, can be um, uh, can be performed easily passively and automatically. But the armor of life requires action, struggle, and suffering. Whereas the will to embrace should be indiscriminative, the full embrace must be discriminated. That doesn't mean any kind of a new fortress mentality. Rather, as adult and realistic Christians, we should seek to transform the evils of the world and to be ready to accept everyone and to help him to become embraced fully. Openness and equality are sine qua non, the hallmarks of the ethics of almost every representative of uh, social Trinitarianism. In addition, the representatives of this doctrine demonstrate that the example of Trinity can teach us hospitality, better and more dynamic and creative understanding of freedom, and a number of other values and principles that are vital to liberal democracy. But in the remaining time, I would like to point at but one elephant in the room. The elephant's name is Marxism, or to put it less dramatically, socialism. Let me clarify to those listeners who can be not familiar enough with Ukrainian both historical and emotional context. We, the Ukrainians, pass down from generation to generation a bitterly learned lesson. Communism is an evil and a terrible thing. And any tendency toward it should be nipped in the bud. Therefore, in my presentation of the social Trinitarianism, a doctrine often accused in being grounded on the Marxist presupposition, I must answer the tacit question, is social Trinitarianism a socialist theory? A short answer is not necessarily. Actually, we have a whole bunch of approaches toward the issues of property and social political systems inside the school of social Trinitarianism. Thus, Jürgen Moltmann uh, does not pay too much attention to the financial or to specific social issues. True, in his reflections about freedom, he condemns the notion of freedom that came to us from the ancient Rome, according to which the extent of one's freedom is directly proportional to the amount of things and 
people he or she possesses. But at the same time, he does not criticize the private property as such. Rather, he offers to complement one's Roman freedom with a more profound, creative, and Christian dimension of a true freedom. Leonardo Boff openly professed social reason. Again, he claims uh, that it is on the basis of his Trinitarian theology. Capitalism, he claims, is grounded on the individual and his or her personal performance, with no essential ties to others and society. At the same time, socialism appears to him as more socially oriented and therefore more Trinity-like system. Michael Novak can hardly be counted as a full-stack social Trinitarianism. Uh, Trinitarianist. Yet, in his book devoted to the Christian dimensions of the democracy and capitalism, he deals with the argumentation similar to the one of both. Democratic capitalism is by no means the kingdom of God, Novak agrees, but it does not mean that it is incompatible with the ideals derived from the example of the Holy Trinity. On the contrary, it is precisely its positive impact on the lives of communities that, make, uh, that makes it even more fitting for the Christians. Democratic capitalism changes the communities, makes them united not on blood and kinship, but on voluntary decision of everyone who wants to join them. Democratic capitalist communities are many, fluid, and vital, not exhausted by the state and not controlled by it. Novak summarizes his arguments as follows. It may seem blasphemous for some uh, to go in the argumentation from the Trinity to the communal patterns of monetary exped, uh, expenditures. Yet, in the patterns of its communal and individual life, a society does reveal its highest ideal, if darkly. Conclusions. This lecture is but a half of the diptych which I currently working with. Concurrently with my study of Western, Catholic and Protestant school of social Trinitarianism I presented today, I research also its orthodox version. All my skepticism toward the simple schemes not understanding, I admit that the famous association of the West with the active Martha and the East with the contemplative Maria is, in case of social Trinitarianist schools, surprisingly accurate. Western schools uh, are much more preoccupied with the social and political activism, whereas Eastern Trinitarianism is concentrated on the imitation of Trinity in one's inner spiritual life. That's why I consider Western school of social Trinitarianism to be a promising source for the reflection for the Christian Democrats. Those who desire to establish something approximate to the kingdom of God on earth, or at least in their countries, may well stop waiting for coming of the other king, Alfred the Great, or Prince Volodymyr the Great, and to devote their political struggle to the promotion of the liberal democracy in their countries. Thank you for your attention. Well, and thank you, Le uh, Leisure, for, for your presentation. Um, you uh, help us delve into the what we call political theology, when we, where we are combining the, the depth of the systematic theology and also liberal uh, democracy. Thank you also for introducing us to, to the um, heritage and thought of Mortmann, Wolf and, and Buff. And uh, thank you for your analysis of uh, how their schools can enrich our political theology or our political science. Um, um, I see that, that, that there are some people who are already presenting, sending your um, questions to our panelists. Uh, feel, please feel free to, to do more um, to the speakers of the first half of our morning session and to the second half uh, of the session. Um, you can do that um, in the chat um, on your screens in, in Zoom. And now uh, I would like to uh, invite our um, third uh, speaker, um, this is Dr. Pavlos Smitsnyuk, the director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies of Ukrainian Catholic University. Um, Pavlo is a mastermind and uh, intellect of, uh, of this institute and also one of the brightest theologians uh, um, in our Ukrainian theological uh, um, audience. Um, uh, Pavlo has studied in, in various places, among others um, in Athens, in Petersburg, in Rome, he completed his doctoral dissertation 
um, at the University of Oxford, where he completed his dissertation on the topic of religion and, and nation, an exercise in comparative political theology with special reference to Christos Yannaras and Sri Aurobindo. Um, he's an expert in, in the modern um, orthodox thought, but also his expertise goes beyond um, theological, but also social and political. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to you and you will speak today on the religious approaches to the goals of uh, sustainable development in the age of cultural wars, insights in the, into the orthodox theology. Pablo. Uh, thank you, Father Oles. Um, I must assure you that everything uh, except my degrees uh, that Father Oles said was uh, completely inaccurate. <laughs> yes, but thank you very much and thank you for uh, our Ukrainian and, and foreign participants, especially to the uh, both institutions from uh, Leuven. Um, so culture wars are a characteristic feature of ecclesiastic life uh, for Christian churches in many countries. Um, Cyril Hovorun, a Ukrainian theologian, suggests that conservatism has become uh, for many churches uh, and groups a new orthodoxy. The implication would be that liberalism, human rights, gender equality, development, progress are heresies to be fought and resisted. An orthodox example of uh, such a critique is Christos Yanaras. Now, Yanaras rejects the modern concept of rights as inherently linked to the Western ideology of individualism. Human rights are too primitive, or as Yanaras says, pre-political. Yanaras' concept of pre-political is reminiscent of Giorgio Agamben's notion of bare life, la nuda vita, o zoe, as opposed to bios. What Yanaras suggests is not that we should abandon human rights, but rather that we should consider them as a transitory, while the goal is, I quote, life according to the truth, end quote. Elsewhere, Yanaras argues that the promotion of the difference of opinions, inevitably, I quote, undermines the functional cohesion, the creative dynamism, or cultural productivity of a specific group, end quote. Thus, it transforms a koinonia, a community united by a mutual worldview, into a societas, unity whose purpose is the attainment of utilitarian goals. And this might remi remind us of uh, Professor um, Ellen van Stiekel, yes, difference between home uh, and hotel. Now, Yanaras is just one example of many religious critiques to human rights and uh, sustainable development goals. Since the 2015 UN resolution transforming our world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the SDGs, at least some of them, became the battlefield between secular and religious understandings of de development. One of the areas in which churches do not share interpretations given to SDGs are questions such as abortion and gender equality. Now, the resolution requests to, I quote, ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services, including service for family planning and education, sexual education, end quote. Although the mentioned resolution does not explicitly speak about LGBT, and it would seem that the term gender refers to a man and woman binary, many UN interpretations are more explicit in linking the gender equality to LGBT rights. The latter is a reason for concerns for many churches. For example, Ukrainian churches express themselves against interpretation of the concept of gender equality that implies gender ideology and free choice of one's gender identity. Thus, churches lobbied against the ratification of the Istanbul Convention in Ukraine. Now, why do churches feel unease uh, with how development is understood and with some of the SDGs. One of the reasons uh, pointed by uh, Anger might be that global development continues to be peculiarly 
bedded to a modernist secular frame. Similarly, Emma Tomalin argued that global development institutions are still dominated by secularist approaches. It is true that modernity came as a challenge to Christendom. Louis Dumont says that while medieval religion was a great cloak, like the mantle of Our Lady of Mercy, like Omofor Bohorodeci, and in modernity, it became an individual affair. It lost its all-embracing capacity and became one among other apparently equal considerations. This has depoliticized religion in a Schmittian sense. Moreover, it gave the state to the state the authority to be the arbiter of what constitutes development and what doesn't. As Tomalin and others claim, this secularist position took hold of the global development industry, claiming that modernization will and indeed should lead to secularization and that religions are outdated and likely to act against development and progress, end quote. Should the above account of the genealogy of modern development prove correct, it is no wonder that churches might be skeptical toward such development as inimical toward religion and the way of keeping religion outside social life and marginalize it. But is the story, the story of tension between religion and secular development, the whole story? I suggest that an important part of the story is that what we take to be a conflict between religious and secular, or between traditional and modern, might be something different. As Christina Stöckel points out, conflicts over values which involve religious actors, and which Stöckel calls post-secular conflicts, are not conflicts between secular and religious worldviews, but between liberal progressive positions and conservative traditionalist positions, end quote. In fact, development, liberalism, and even secularity are not inherently uh, something anti-Christian. They can be defended on a theological basis. Christian tradition with its doctrine of the kingdom of God, which is kingdom of justice, the idea of Trinity, which gives space for diversity within God himself or herself or God the self. And the teaching that human beings are the image of God could have been a key conceptual contributor to the concept of development. Aristotle Papa Nicolaou, to give just one orthodox example, points out that uh, both human rights and modern liberal democracy can be considered as being in harmony with the Trinitarian and ascetic principles of Christianity. Yes, and both Viore uh, and Oleg have explored uh, this question from different perspectives. So how to uh, deal with this situation? Which side should Christians join? Should they be with the liberals or with the conservatives? I would like to address these questions by engaging with the Russian religious thinker Vladimir Solovyov. Solovyov, in his essay, Plato's Life Drama, tries to understand why Plato became an idealist. The condemnation of Socrates, so the argument goes, was a result of understanding between conservatives and the sophists or liberals. And the key Solovyov ideas is that two ideological extremes joined, merged, they might not be as incompatible as they pretend to be. Who were the Athenian conservatives? Conservatives defended traditional norms. Don't dare to touch this or it will collapse. But is it worth conserving? Don't dare to ask. It is worthly simply by the fact that it exists, that we have grown a costume to it that is ours. In other words, conservatives protect the tradition, not only from alteration, but most importantly, from questioning and discussion. On the opposite side, there were sophists who had lost all faith in the teetering traditional foundations of the national way of life, but did not have moral insights to devote themselves to a search for a better 
norms of existence. Both parties profess the impossibility of the attainment of truth, although they draw the opposite conclusions. The conservatives in favor of tradition, since the true ca truth cannot be attained, one should follow the rules that exist already, while the sophists in favor of utilitarian approach to life. Since the truth cannot be known, one should behave as it pleases her. Socrates was different. He did not stop at his, I know only what I, that I know nothing, but he made a next step. He who recognizes his ignorance still knows something and can know more. If you don't know, then learn. If you don't possess the truth, then look for it. For this reason, Socrates was a threat to both parties insofar as he constituted a tertium quid, a third way, capable of shaking the foundations of both the conservatives and sophists. Socrates was saying to the conservatives, it's fine that you are the guardians, but the trouble is that you are poor guardians. You don't know what to conserve and how to conserve it. And to the sophists, Socrates say, you do very well to put to test of your critical thought all that exists. It's a pity only that you are poor thinkers and do not at all understand either the purposes or the methods of critical, of real criticism. I propose that what Solovyov says about conservatives and sophists of the classical age could help us to understand better the nature of modern cultural wars. Fundamentalism and liberalism are modern categories and surely differ from what Solovyov is speaking about, but a couple of analogies still could be drawn. There are three points which I find interesting. The first is that both ideologies are reflexive. Conservatives draws on liberalism, not only the other way around. We often tend to believe that fundamentalism is a default approach to reality, while liberalism reacts on it by challenging things which some people hold fundamental. But Solovyov emphasizes fundamentalism reactionary nature. This resonates with Chakravati Ram Prasad's argument that fundamentalism is both modern and against modernity. It is the former because its raison d'etre is given by the modern break with the historical unexamined identification with the tradition. But it is the latter against modernity because it wishes to go back to the fundamentals of the tradition. Or to put this uh, with Charles Taylor, it seems true of all fundamentalism that they paradoxically are the most modern when they think that they are most faithful to tradition." End quote. Another important intuition which we could grasp from Solovyo is that fundamentalism is not fundamental enough. Conservatives absolutize external traditional forms because they are unable to grasp the essence. This resonates with Slya Greenfield's argument that fundamentalism means religious superficialism. In other words, conservatives may be attempting to conserve something which was historically never there in the first place, or at least wasn't important. The second point important for my argument is to address the question of whether liberalism and fundamentalism or conservatism are not by any chance tautological. Solovyo seems to, su seems to suggest that conservatives and modernists are two sides of the same coin insofar as neither of them believes that truth is actually attainable. Both are pessimistic movements. The third point of communality between the two extremes of the ideological dichotomy is that both tend to absolutize what is not absolute. In Solovyov, not only conservatives, but only sophists, hurried to elevate factual ignorance arbitrarily to law in order to conclude from this what they wanted. One could therefore conclude that this absolutization of what is secondary constitutes a key element of both conservatism and liberalism, and perhaps of ideology as such. Consider Raimundo Spanikar's definition of ideology. 
I quote, an ideology is a system of ideas formulated by a logos incapable of transcending its own temporality, end quote. While conservatism often looks to the golden age of the past, often more imagined than real, liberalism attempts to transform the present in the name of an idealized future, often rejecting the experience of the past. Now, to conclude, I would like to conclude with the question of whether a non-ideological Christianity, non-ideological approach to development, to sustainable development goals is ever possible. Can this going beyond ideological approaches, uh, can this going beyond ideological approaches to development, to rights, to equality be possible? I would suggest that the answer will be rather no than yes. But this answer, instead of discouraging the church communities, should be an invitation to vigilance, to constant discernment, to indisciplinary research and conversation, and to a more apophatic approach to what we preach. Discernment might sometimes entail that we would arrive to a conclusion that some conservative ideas are incompatible with the Christian ethos and some secular ideas are not, and the vice versa. Thank you for your attention. Well, and uh, thank you, uh, Paula. Um, thank you for uh, touching this uh, intricate uh, topic on, on uh, cultural wars. Um, uh, you, you've, you've managed to present the conservatives and liberals uh, and um, show how um, these two groups need each other, uh, so to say. And thank you also for, um, for raising this fundamental question. Can Christianity be non-ideological? Um, for most, um, uh, I don't know, popular thinkers, I think uh, uh, they would uh, respond in a negative way with you. You, you actually um, have shown a very uh, good point for actually positively res responding to, to, to this uh, uh, difficult question. So thank you for, for this profound and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Now we have uh, not much time, but uh, about half an hour for questions and answers. Um, as I mentioned, um, these questions can be addressed or should be addressed uh, to, to the speakers from the first half of our today's seminar and to the second half our seminar. We had a banquet of IT yesterday. Um, we had um, presentations on Catholic social thought, on Orthodox social thought, also Protestant understanding of um, pro Protestant contribution to, to the notion of hope and how that is not irrelevant from just personal subjective dimension, but also to, to political and also um, even uh, economic, uh, speaking about markets that need the category of hope, uh, theology and political science, cultural wars, uh, all these um, different dimensions of thinking of how can we um, project or envision uh, a society um, that is being developed in a sustainable way um, from despair to, to hope. So um, I'm inviting you to to, to pose your question, to uh, present your question to, to, to the audience. We already have a few. Um, the, one of the first questions would be to, what I have here, to Professor Alan Van Stichel. This is a question from uh, Christina uh, Poletko. Uh, are you with us, uh, Alan? I, I hope you are. I cannot see on the screen, but uh, I think somewhere in the digital world, uh, uh, in the digital world, you are here. So let me read this question to you. Uh, you rightly underlined this intuition that one cannot export the development. It has to be contextual. On the other hand, Pope Francis reminds us that the same degree of development as we observed in the Western world is simply unsustainable. But the problem is that many societies that did not enjoy the same level of development look at the West 
as the model to strive for. They probably rightly uh, do so, dream of repeating its success story and may not see so clearly the hidden problems with that success. They may want to have this development ex exported. What would you respond to these strivings, to these desires, so that we don't ask too much of the developing societies? Okay, thank you. So yes, I am with you. Um, um, it's interesting that you refer to Christina that you refer to Pope Francis because I was mentioning the sin of the bishops of uh, 1971, and in that document, the bishops with the majority coming from the south was already pointing that out. It literally states somewhere uh, in the document that um, uh, the, that yeah it doesn't talk about unsustainable, but it, it clearly mentions I don't have the exact quote, but it clearly mentions the fact that uh, our Earth cannot handle that kind of development in the 19 in, in 1971. You know, um, uh, already bishops were aware of that, and especially the bishop from the south saw that coming. Um, there is a lot of uh, ambiguity about this, I think, because um, just intuitively what comes to my mind is that uh, you have, um, I mean, I, I, of course, I understand and I see uh, the fairness of the question to a certain level of development so that it's not, it's not really fair that uh, we would uh, hinder people from having a similar kind of development as we had with all the prosperity that it brings, um, while they are also now already uh, being vulnerable to the consequences of that development. Uh, so it, it would not be fair to say like, well, you cannot develop because uh, our, art can, our, our earth cannot take it anymore. Um, I think one of the main challenges will be that, um, in a way, the more prosperous countries, and I'm talking for myself here, will have to find ways ways to deal with less. I mean, in in somewhere, in some way, there has to be um, a bit more equal distribution if we will want to give people a, a dignified life, um, then we have to have some kind of redistribution or at least some kind of development or growth model that, that is sustainable. Um, I, for instance, find this whole notion, but I'm not going to go into detail into it, but the whole um, notion of reward of the donut economy very interesting because she takes this into account, the sustainability factor, but also the, the fairness question of what kind of development um, is fair for for countries and people who are not yet developed yet. On the other hand, I see that we have uh, exported a particular um, uh, model of development. And the question is whether that was really the best thing to do. For example, I, I, I know that, um, and it are very small examples and you can uh, make a character, char character, is that how you say it? From it, uh, caricature from it, but, um, for example, how we've introduced the eating of bread in certain parts of Africa, um, whereas their daily meal would, would consist of other things, um, um, which means that we, we are exporting things to them um, at the expense of their local economies. Uh, so how can we sustain and help to, to develop their local economies um, while not just exporting everything uh, to them and and and, and offering it, um, I'm, I don't know whether I make myself clear, but I think it is a very uh, challenging question, and you're right um, to pose it. But that would, for now, be my response, I guess. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, I think uh, this is the answer that has to be addressed from both sides, from the developed countries. How can they more adequately approach? the assistance that they provide to the developing countries and also to the developing countries, how they uh, use the, the assistance uh, received. Um, very often in Ukrainian context, uh, the assistance, the financial assistance that uh, we receive sometimes goes not into the reforms, but into the pockets of uh, some politicians. And that's a, and that's a moral uh, challenge of how 
you know, the, how to build further this relationship. That this is how we've been perceived in the, I don't know, in, in the last 10 years, I would say. You know, this relationship between EU and uh, associated members or those other uh, countries that aspire to join European Union. But um, thank you for giving the, these guidelines uh, uh, that you just uh, expressed. Uh, there is another question to Ivan Prunuk. Um, Ivan, if, if you'd like to come um, to join me uh, at this uh, panel session, this is a question from your colleague. Um, in your suggestion to pay more attention to the virtuous agents, uh, what kind of virtues are especially needed for the financial market agents? Um, I don't know if you, uh, if you would uh, yeah. be so kind to, to respond to, to this. Uh, There's a mic. Should I, should I use the microphone? Maybe, yes. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, in my presentation, I mentioned Philip Booth, and he actually claims on the importance of the virtue ethics. Uh, he says about four cardinal virtues indeed. First and foremost, uh, the market agents, professional clients, and also regulators, they, uh, they should practice the virtue of justice. Uh, that will allow participants not take advantage over one another and not take advantage over vulnerabilities of other market agents. Like, uh, for example, it will eliminate the, such an injustice in the sphere of the financial market as the information asymmetry. Uh, justice will help build us trust and trust is a very important for making a good business, which is social, but also profitable. Also uh, the virtue of prudence. Uh, the example catechism says that prudence uh, guides us to think what is good and bad. And in the financial markets, uh, not everything is clear, not, it's not, not white and not black, sometimes it's gray. And virtue of prudence will allow us to, to think what in the certain context will this action be good or bad. And also temperance and fortitude, like temperance will build humility within us. So if, for example, you see is it other participants uh, in the financial markets are uh, wrongdoing, you may refrain from it. And sometimes you have to have courage to go and fortitude to go into, into the opposition to the whole system. This is my answer to this question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, there are several participants um, that are present actually in this audience, in this physical uh, room. Perhaps uh, some of you would like to raise a question so you can just come up to the to the microphone and uh, express um, your thoughts and, uh, and commentaries and questions um, I'm uh, I'm here a bit uh, in the technical uh, in the double world I'm in the physical uh, seminar room and also looking into the into the chats of the zoom and I uh, perhaps I missed some of the questions if, if you have presented anything, could you restate that or resend it to our panelists so that I can uh, um, speak them, uh, read them out? Um, if you're still doing this, uh, I will allow myself to uh, abuse my uh, role as a moderator and uh, raise a question to, to Paolo, Paolo if, you, if you don't mind, because you really touched on the nerve uh, for, for the Christians, uh, it is um, a very pressing question. You, you see the, these churches that are um, conservative, Orthodox churches, usually presented as a, as a conservative. Catholic churches somewhere in the middle. Um, and Protestant churches are sometimes perceived as, uh, at least in the second half of the 20th century, as extremely um, open-minded, so to say. And, and there is a there is this mutual conversion. I think. Um, how do you see ecumenism as as an encounter of the theologians of the people of faith from different groups, um, learning from each other? Um, are there any uh, is is ecumenism contributing to this uh, uh, culture wars, uh, helping the fundamentalists? remain the fundament to be fundamentalists or the liberals to remain their 
in their liberal thinking and secretly, secretly um, aspiring to convert um, those into, into their groups or ecumenism has a, has a different role. Um, so question is, what is ecumenism contributing to, to these culture wars? Is there a sign of hope of the reconciliation? How would you see that? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Father uh, Olaf. I think that uh, I would say several things to answer your question. In a way, uh, this panel is a, yes, a moment of ecumenical learning. Yes, we have Catholic uh, theologians, Orthodox theologian, Protestant theologian. I am Catholic, but speaking on Protestant authors, uh, Lef uh, is working on Moltmann. So you have, uh, in a way, the boundaries uh, of theological engagement with, uh, with social uh, doctrine uh, don't exist anymore. Eh? I don't know what, uh, how a no Catholic uh, approach to you know, integral ecology is different from orthodox approach to uh, integral ecology. You know, maybe my colleagues uh, have uh, different opinions. I don't know the answer. I don't think there is much of that because we have so much been learning from different traditions. Yes, Pope Francis, uh, I think, invited John Zizoulas to present his Laudato Si encyclical. Uh, now, uh, he, he quotes, I don't know, in several paragraphs, Patriarch Bartholomew, yes, who was a pioneer of, of uh, church engagement with ecology. So this shows that uh, a lot of things that we now consider almost normative are products of, uh, of ecumenical learning. Now, this is, I think, very positive uh, and very good. There is a negative side to it. Um, um, Father um, you know, Antonio Spadaro, yes, the, 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 the uh, editor-in-chief of La Civiltà Cattolica, yes, Italian Jesuit uh, uh, journal, uh, he, he has an article uh, uh, quote uh, which is entitled Ecumenism of Hate, and he says you have very like conservative forces in, uh, in the Christian world who decided to cooperate and to, to lead a crusade against uh, modernity. And he says, you have Russian Orthodox church that is cooperating with uh, you know, North American evangelicals. Then you can add, I don't know, the very interesting dialogue of Russian Orthodox church uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, right-wing parties in, uh, in Europe, yeah, in various countries, uh, in Italy, uh, probably in the Netherlands, I don't know about Belgium. You have a dialogue of the Russian Orthodox Church with Iran on human rights, which is very Western, which is very uh, uh, anti-modern. So you have also ecumenism of, uh, of people who want to fight modernity, which is interesting. Yeah? I, I think that uh, we have also to learn something from that, but we need to be uh, to be conscious that the uh, conscience that it is uh, going on and, and what are the consequences. My third point is to say, is to ask, is not our ecumenical dialogue reduced to social issues? Now, uh, this is sort of uh, a criticism of what ecumenical social week is because we try to be ecumenical about dealing with social issues, we promote this. But I think if we are self-critical, we also understand that on many levels, we almost stop talking theology yeah, with the Orthodox, with Protestants. We prefer talking about uh, how we can serve uh, our planet better. And maybe it's good because while we you know, argue about filioque, uh, uh, primacy, uh, there is no more clean water to drink and we die you know, in having all these beautiful theological discussions. But on another side, it can be like an easy solution. Yeah, the churches need to show that they're useful to 
to the society, to the UN, to the nation state, uh, build strong Ukraine, uh, uh, be, I don't know, morality, marshals, uh, the families means good demographics, uh, more taxpayers, etc. So there is also a, a side of this ecumenical cooperation for, uh, for, for social issues, which can, can be, which can be uh, uh, I think, tricky, eh? and we need to, to understand that it's going on. Thank you. Uh, also self-critical yeah, and i don't know maybe my colleagues uh, want to jump in and to say what is their take uh, what, what what other possibilities and dangers do they see in in ecumenical uh, engagement with social issues all right, right. well uh, if uh, participants of the panel have their thoughts and ideas please uh, uh, yeah. raise your voice yeah. Maybe I can say briefly something. Uh, Absolutely, please, please do so. Thank you very much, Pablo, for your uh, answer to this question. Uh, I also agree with you that in the past we had a schism between uh, Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity based on doctrinal political, uh, uh, but mostly based on doctrinal issues. And nowadays I think the risk of schism is between liberals and conservatives. Uh, and not only within the Orthodox Church, but also in the Catholic Church and so on and so forth. And uh, Pablo was right when he, 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 was, uh, he referred to this alternative model of ecumenism, an ecumenism between conservat only between conservatives or an alliance between conservatives of different Christian denominations or an alter uh, alternative ecumenism between um, more liberal uh, Christians. And I think that what, what the vocation of churches uh, is, is to, yeah, is to heal this tendency of schism between conservatives and uh, liberals. For instance, uh, nowadays in Orthodox countries, I think that churches are, um, or the Orthodox Church is tended to take side of the more conservative, leaving liberal Christians a bit outside its, uh, its embracement. So I think what the church needs to do, the Orthodox Church needs to do, is to, to bring conservative and liberals uh, together. And another point I'd like to mention is that nowadays, for instance, the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, um, the Orthodox Bishop of Constantinople, has better relationship with uh, relationships with the Pope of Rome, from the Catholic side, than with the Patriarch of, of Moscow, for instance. And what, what does it mean ecumenically? What does it mean in terms of ecclesiology and so forth? There is a conversation, a dialogue between the Pope and the ecumenical Patriarch, but there is a, let's call it unilateral schism between Moscow and, uh, and, and Constantinople. So thank you very much. Uh, th thank you for mentioning this. I remember visiting once um, uh, in a group uh, patriarch of uh, Ilya of, uh, of Georgia, we met in uh, in Tbilisi, and it was just uh, one year after the so-called Rose Revolution, uh, Revolution of Roses, uh, and he said something very profound that I still remember. That he uh, the, the Orthodox Church is not the church of the of one camp or another camp; it's the church of, of for all Georgia, and so. Uh, this healing aspect, uh, or the creating the framework to, you know, from different groups to be able to speak to each other. And I think uh, this is something that really um, brings to my mind uh, yesterday night session when we talked about Germany in the uh, middle of the 20th century, where um, the lack of dialogue actually leads to the growth of nationalism and this. Uh, um, these ideologies that um, begin to kill people. So uh, uh, perhaps uh, to answer the question that I raised to to Paolo is to uh, you know the, the ecumenical role um, is to at least be constant um, forum for the exchange of ideas. At least to build the dialogue. You know, we we may not leave the this room being converted but at least we, we are able to listen to each other's opinions and um, enrich ourselves and that's what's happening i think increasingly um with the ecumenical success on on, on many different levels so um uh, thank you Viera, to, for pointing out this uh, this um i was told that um our room needs to be um uh, sanitized because these are the COVID uh, pre uh, uh 
requirements, but we still have a few minutes to, to raise questions. So if anybody wants to contribute or uh, comment or uh, raise any question, uh, we still have a few, few, few minutes to do that. Are there? Um, if you would like to raise a question or comment, just raise your hand, turn on your speaker and, uh, and speak and, and then our technicians will uh, uh, direct you to, to the main uh, screen, so to say. If not, um, I think I would like to thank uh, all of you for, for your uh, profound and uh, hardworking presentations to to the uh, to the questions and uh, answers that were raised. Um, we had, uh, as I said before, uh, several extremely profound and uh, uh, diverse uh, presentations from from different groups, from different churches, from different academias, and um, uh, special thanks to to the. Catholic University of Leuven and also Evangelical Theological uh, Faculty of, of Leuven uh, for being our long year partner. Um, many professors from Ukraine have been trained um, in that wonderful um, university and brought the wisdom um, to Ukraine and now are helping Ukrainian society to stand on their uh, on its feet and, uh, and grow. So. Uh, Thank you very much. And I, I'm looking forward indeed for, for our next sessions. Um, um, we are now facing the uh, uh, time for lunch, but in the after lunch at 2 p.m. Ukrainian time or Kievan time, we will have a discussion on restoration of ecosystem, ex ecosystems and biodiversity as the main priority of the decade actual steps and needs of the humanity and so um, if you're interested please uh, join us again to to the following sessions we will have uh, two more uh, today and also tomorrow so please stay tuned um, send us your thoughts and ideas via um, email or, or messages uh, we would like to build the network of, of friends and scholars um, and join our forces for our next projects Thank you very much again and see you soon. Bye bye. Інститут економічних студій Українського католицького університету у співпраці з фондом Конрада Аденауера за підтримки Львівської міської ради запрошують до участі у міжнародному суспільному форумі. З 5 по 9 жовтня, 14-й екумінічний соціальний тиждень, плекаючи спільне благо разом до сталого розвитку суспільства. Як спільними зусиллями досягати цілей сталого розвитку та будувати справедливий світ? Як зберегти довкілля, біорізноманіття, екосистеми суші та води? Як адаптувати міста до змін?